Okay, so this week we are going to go over um, the overall security approaches and practices in other areas. So we talked about access management previously, uh, the prior weeks, and then we also touch on a few things last week regarding some attacks and network security and network appliances last week. Okay. So in this week, we are going to touch on other areas like how to manage change, how to do updates, um, how to work with virtualization and the type of attacks. Okay. So I recommend that we read the notes and the chapter if you have the book because your certifications are going to ask some of the questions that I might not hit on your assignment. But we're going to try to cover most of that. Okay. So let me hold on. Let me microphone. Oh. Okay. So your notes, you should be downloading chapter five notes. And so before let's before we answer these questions, uh, let's take a look at these things. So we have talked about virtualization in the past. It's definitely a cost saving area of your infrastructure. Most of your cloud server now uses virtualization, right? Um, you would see that Azure, Google, um, AWS, mostly is AWS hosts a lot of companies. So virtualization is a central area. So you have a lot of different products that are out there. And sometimes companies like AWS will implement their own, but if you understand how to work with virtualization, it's really simple, right? So you have a physical server that has an IP address and on its storage, you are maintaining different virtual machines. And so the software that you're using to manage those virtual machines are the hypervisor, like your virtual box, your v VMware player, or your workstation. Um, if you're using Microsoft, that will be your Hyper-V. And Microsoft has its own certification in this area, right? Now, the whole system is what you're using to run that virtual machine on. So for us, in here, we're using Windows 10. That's going to be your host, your Windows PC. And then your guest operating system, like last week, we were using Kali Linux. So that's a guest operating system. So how many can you run? How many virtual machines can you run? What is it limited to? Anybody? Can I run a hundred virtual machines? As much as your RAM is allowed, right? So if I have 16 gig of RAM and I'm allocating two gig to each virtual machine, how many can I run? Remember that you have to have RAM for the the host OS as well, right? So if we take 16 divided by two gig, we should have eight. But should I run eight virtual machines? That leaves nothing for the, the host OS, right? It needs at least two gig to, to live, right? To operate. So you are going to be limited to about seven if you're allocating two gigs of RAM per virtual machine. And you can run a little lower, like one gig, but it's slower, right? So the low, the lower the RAM that you give it, the slower it's going to be. So that's why we normally give it about two gig. Can I give it more? Sure. If you're running high-end application inside the virtual machine, you need to give it more, more RAM. Like playing game inside your VM. Can you do that? You can, right? It's not recommended, but you can. Okay. So... Some of the terms that you need to know for the new Security Plus certification, you need to understand the terminology with scalability and elasticity. Okay, so when we want when we say scalability is how adaptable into the growth. So if you have virtual machine, you want to be able to resize the memory, the processor. I can allocate multiple core to the virtual machine. So I'm gonna give you an example. I, I had to teach advanced Python last, last semester and they all use virtual machine to run because Linux is best to test advanced Python program. So we, we have multiple core allocated to that virtual machine so that way it would use the core concurrently executing the task in those applications. 
right? So if you have an eight core, you can give those virtual machines four core and those four cores gonna be used for the application that we run within the virtual machine. So you want it to be scalable where you can resize the, the capacity of your computation. Now in some cloud server environment, you are limited to also the RAM, right? When you get free services from Amazon, they're gonna give you four gig of RAM or two gig of RAM for your VM. And that's what you're gonna use. Now, elasticity is allowing you to dynamically change based on the load, like what we talked about before. So if one month I need less, I can reduce that down to the memory size, which costs me less. And other months, we might need more, right? So all of these things are important in for, for you as you enter the industry, right? My time when I didn't have a lot of this, right? Virtual machine only came about in the last maybe decade, a couple decades ago. So what you see is this is abundant. This is what you're using. You also hear the term container for virtualization. So in security, what we want to see also is how each of the service is tied to the application. Every application use a group of services in one way or another. For example, your web browser, it uses the services, right, to connect to the internet to be able to give you the content of the web page through HTTP. And that's part of the get HTTP standard, right? Or in other cases, we might need to use SSH to be able to connect remotely to a, a server, for example. So what you can do is you can manage the container and look at who the access capability for that container. So it needs to be isolated. Why do I need to isolate it from other apps? Why do you think that is? All of these access system at the low level, right? So when you're looking at Linux or, or, or Windows OS, it's gonna use the kernel area on the low level, but you do have a layer before that. So now in some malware cases, it does, manipulate your kernel level. So if we isolate it from a user, the user area in, in specific container, it, it is manageable, right? So you can take a look at, you know, your certificates, your encryption keys, your, that ties to the certain services. So when you're using HTTPS, that ties to the public key. That's how it's gonna stream all the encryption bit to be able to establish that session for that app. So when we're, when we're controlling it as individual container, if it is impacted, we can prevent it from spreading across even though it's on the same server, you see? So now the downside also in the virtual machine is that it's gonna require some licenses and, and software and so on, very similar to the regular machine. Also, people used to think that you cannot attack VM. That's wrong right? You can come from the VM and you can get to the host through what's called the VM escape. Okay. When, when I started learning VM long, long ago, right? Um, when they first came out, um, a lot of people used to use virtual machine to trick like the, 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 the fisher, right? The, the people who contact you, the scammers, right? Um, you probably have seen YouTube video. There were a couple famous ones that the guy like lured this guy in because he was trying to scam him. And using Windows XP virtual machine, you know, he was trying to scam back, right? So attack back. Is that ethical? Probably not, okay? But, you know, you do get some risk in the VM escape. So in the first question, we can answer that the benefits of having virtualization in the network is number one, it cuts costs. We don't have to buy hundreds and thousands of server. We can buy a few and we can run more, yeah, right? Depending on the amount of RAM that you have, the storage, also your disk drive and your processor. Okay, yes. So, well, yeah, in the video it shows that he 
he gave them his, his virtual machine information and then, you know, he scans them back, right? Because as they are connecting to him, you know, he said, oh, go ahead and log into my computer. And he was able to scan them back. And with that, it, it, you know, he's able to identify them and who they are and so on, right? But there are other ways that you can also find people as well. Uh, that's why a lot of the times they use like those, you know, those virtual voice, like your Google voice and things like that. So that way it's a little bit harder to track them with their phone number. Okay. So we, we definitely would be able to reduce costs where we would save money there. Right, even on cloud services, you, you can run multiple virtual machines or instances, that's what they're called, right? Um, on your on your cloud docker. So a couple of a few types of the hypervisor, they're level one and level two hypervisor. Most of those that you see there are level they call hypervisor two. They are software application that used to manage resources for your virtual machine and run, right? As you saw how we would use your virtual box or your VBox, uh, very common, or VMware Workstation Player. So VMware Workstation Player is free. That's different than VMware Workstation, which gives you the trial period. Um, if, you, if you want to get really deep into the industry, you should get VMware certification that will start with the vSphere. If you put that on your resume, a lot of people look for that because many companies use virtualization through VMware. Uh, and then you have the Microsoft Hyper-V looks and feel very much like VMware. Um, they, they took that, that design and they implemented it for Microsoft and you can also get certification for that, okay? So as we talked about different types of attack, Right, uh, so your VMware, VM escape is a, a type of attack where your, the attacker will have access to your system as a VM uh, system and crawl through that to, into the host. So they will be able to, because the host is connected to your, your virtual machine, right, with hardware and also with network communication. So it's still seeing it as the same in the network. Okay, so how can you prevent some of this? You need to make sure that you patch your software and, and your firmware. I didn't put down the firmware, but you know, just make sure that you run your patches. Okay. So some of the cloud lab company, they are using old software, which creates a lot of problems. It slows and it, it you know, so, and we should always want to install tests and install updates. And one of the areas that I talk about is your VM sprawl. So to really manage this, you need to implement policies, okay, and access and, and how that can adapt to change. So we need to do some change management and we would configure things to be different in the changes for the virtual machine. So in some company, they would use virtual machines with the thin client and thin clients are simply a computer system that is reduced in hardware, right? It might look like a small box like this, like your, your cable box or your home router. And in it, it has limited RAM and, and storage and processor, right? All its job is to be able to connect to the network and access the server to pull the virtual machine image, right? Not necessarily download, but access it. So in that case, what you have, what will happen is the user can, you know, create design, store data, and then it will just update the server. So those thin clients, they are expensive in that you still have to get licenses, even though the box is very cheap, okay? So your software is going to cost more than your hardware. And then with that, you need to make sure that you manage your system and scale it over time. Okay. Because sometimes that can be high usage and you want to make sure that network connectivity, your bandwidth is always essential with those thin clients because it's relying heavily on the network. Can't people just pirate their license or something? 
So the story about pirate, right? So long ago, I had a student that graduated and he got a job as a, a, a Windows admin for oh. one of the big company like HP. And so his job was to take one of the old server and upgrade it. Okay. And at the time they were using like server 2003, which is long ago, right? I've been teaching for a long time. So what he did was he used a pirated license to upgrade their server, right? He was fired on the first day of the job, right? So never do that because the company does get fined heavily for using like illegal license, okay? So no, we don't use pirate license. We want to pay for the license and you can get both seats for some of these license, okay? This counts at least, okay. So in virtual machine, you can replicate your virtual machine in a network by using the copies, right, for backup. This is important because in the case where if it corrupts or something happens to that VM, you have another version of it. So in VirtualBox, you saw how I, 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 I created that, right? You can, you can make another version of it, a duplicate of it, by using the software itself, the hypervisor to, to create it, okay? And so in VirtualBox, you simply is just gonna use this and then in your machine option, right? You can clone it, you can move it and so on, right? Most of the time when we clone it, we simply, we copy the folder where the files exist. But remember that all of these VMs it saves a status of what, how you use it and what you modify in it because it is a state machine. You guys understand what a state machine is? It's like a vending machine, right? It changes based on what you input. So when you put in a coin, right? Let's say I, I wanna buy a can of soda and I put in a few coins, right? Because of those coins, it rotates and drops the soda can, right? So with that is one soda can less. Correct? So as you input the data, you make configuration, it changes the state of your virtual machine, okay? So what it does is it creates a status file and it puts it into a folder and it uses that file every time, the next time that you open your virtual machine. So it's like, you know, when you watch a DVD or a movie or on Blu-ray, you hit a pause, right? So what that does, is it takes a snapshot of what happened to that virtual machine at that moment in time. And that's, the book talks about snapshot, right? And it saves that status information in the folder. So when you open it next, it reverts back to that and, and be able to include all the new configuration that you added to it since day one, okay? All right, so that, um, touches on, right, your hypervisor, your escape, and I talk a little bit about the snapshot. So in that, we want to replicate this, okay? And in some companies, they also archive this um, as a backup, okay? Now, backup files are a little bit different than what you would normally copy folders over, it, you know, backup tools are used to mark that it uses a certain file, like in Windows, it'll use the, the BKP, and in that, it's actually compressed. So when you recover from a backup, it takes longer because you have to decompress that file and be able to retrieve. So recovery process is just as long or even longer. Now, when you take a snapshot of your virtual machine, it is like what I said, it records that state in a moment of time. Right, so if I did it yesterday at 3 p.m., it's gonna record the state of my VM on how I use. Let's say I downloaded updates on my Linux machine. I install your Senia, like what we've done, right? So those applications will always exist after that point because it, it creates a snapshot of it, okay? So it changes the state from the original. Any questions? So now in companies, in the book, it talks about how you would use two different types of desktop for virtual machines. You would have what's called the 
persistent virtual desktop, which is customizable to the image, such as they can save data, they can install application, that's changed. And then you have companies that use non-persistent virtual desktop. It's like here, right? They have an image for your desktop. So when you, you shut down the computer, when it reboots, it wipes everything, it deep freeze everything. So the, the great thing about non-persistent virtual desktop is it's always going to revert back to the state where the company wants it to reduce storage costs and the maintenance costs. Because even when the user installs something that could cause negative impact on that system, the non-persistent desktop always revert to its prior state. Whereas the persistent virtual desktop, it actually saves the state of what the user has added. Okay, so if they download a malware or something, it's going to impact it. Okay. So if you're using persistent virtual desktop, we have to think of a way to really control the user privilege on that system. Okay, that's important. Any questions? So the two main things, the difference between these two is one is customizable, the other one is not, right? And most companies, they like to lock it down using the non-persistent virtual desktop because ultimately it is money. If you don't let them make changes, you won't have to do as much maintenance. You still do, but it's not as much maintenance and, and upgrade to the system. Because if you if they download a lot of files and use a lot of data, then your storage cost will go up, your hardware cost will go up, and your maintenance cost will go up. So we are expect the in IT in general, the life of your system is between three to five years heavy use. Okay. So regular use, that's the life of your system. So the end of life, we have to flush them out and then Sometimes you also need to upgrade within that time, right? Especially when we upgrade OS, that ties sometimes with hardware and that will incur costs. So why is this impacting security? Because your availability is so important. You gotta make sure your system is always available, okay? And, and be able to handle all the needs of your user. Okay, question. Okay, so after the virtualization, uh, it goes into securing your system. So when you're designing security solution, it's always a layered approach. You have to think about all the components that's inside, right? Last week we talked about networking. So that's one area. This week we're going to talk a little bit more about your system and your OS and things like that. And then we're going to get into the users. And then we're going to get into the logical, the physical. So it is a layered approach, okay, to prevent persistent threat. Question, yes. instructions right at the low level so in ransomware it uses library to encrypt at the low level and then it generates a key sometimes that it sends the key to the creator but most of the time those keys don't work you know that so in those case what will happen is even if you're using a virtual machine what happens is just lock that virtual machine but in ransomware it spreads very quickly so that, that virtual machine exists in the network, it could impact your host or another machine already, right? As soon as it's activated, because the way they write the program is not just to encrypt, but spread, right? To be able to look at the network, so it does a scan and it's looking at your network ID and it spreads. And that's how people, you know, take down segments of network that way. Yeah, so, you know, just, so even if you use your virtual machine, run run security software on it. That's end firewall. Okay, safe. <laughs> All right. 
So um, here it talks about how you need to look at endpoint security. So your endpoint systems or your mobile devices, that's a huge risk, right? As people entering and leaving your mobile network or your wireless network. And then what they use is they, they have a thing called endpoint detections response or the T, uh, ETDR. This is like an overall software tool that they use to scan the health of your systems when they connect and um, also monitor the threats that are coming in and, and leaving your network, okay? And blocking those. Now, baseline configuration, you're gonna hear this a lot in security. So a baseline is established based on the behavior of your system and your network. A lot of the time we use historical data or logs. So what that will do is it's gonna really allow you to really make changes as you need and configure what you need. And with baseline configuration, your main emphasis is gonna measure how these automated tools are gonna give you resilience in security. That's the main purpose in establishing baseline, okay? Most company, their baseline is very low, the minimal because it, it, it is cost related, okay? And how you can remediate. So you are gonna use um, a method called the NAC, which is network access control. And this, this stuff is newly added to security plus. It wasn't there before. So this is the in, what the industry needs to, because I didn't touch on this until I got to my master's program in 2008. So, you know, now you get it in security plus. So it's, it's definitely a need in this area. So in that, what you need is you need to establish your basic settings that need to make sure that your, your operation is secure. Okay, so these are some of the things. And so let's touch on what we need to do as far as system security. Okay, so we need to monitor and protect your endpoints. That's a must. Okay, running sniffers, running tools like your EDR. That's very important. You need to manage configurations to the changes. You don't have to put verbatim. You can summarize what you think that would be good for the, the answer. You need to install updates and that can be OS, applications, firmware, drivers, you name it. So normally we would have an inventory list of our updates, right? A matrix on which one that we've done and which version. You have to track them. So some company, some software tools, they actually have um, database that's integrated for your updates and it automatically pulls it. We need to implement um, and, and maintain security in change management and configuration management. And we'll talk about more detail about that today because they're gonna ask you that on Security Plus and other certification in security. So when you deploy the application the services, the protocols, they need to, we need to make sure that they are less vulnerable, okay? So if you're using SSL instead of TLS, you need to make sure that your services get changed to TLS, okay? Because SSL has the heart bleed and it has flaws, so we don't want that to occur again. You hear the wanna cry, right? Wanna cry is because of the, that heart bleed issues in your build. Okay, you need to uninstall unnecessary software starting with your mobile devices. The apps that you don't use, right? My, my Android phone is great at telling me the inventory of the apps I haven't used for more than a week. So that way I can remove it, right? And then, so we want to make sure that we educate our user with that too. Okay. We want to disable accounts that we don't need and eventually remove it. And then also the guest accounts is important. Okay. And we need to remove backdoors and that needs to go back to the development team because the backdoors are used to tie services for, at the higher privilege. It's a way that developer can later on access the application to modify and, and upgrade the application. So they would leave, you know, maybe a, a, a segment of the code in there 
that allows them to be able to connect to certain services or authenticate at a low level, okay? And that's how attacker would get in. The majority of the time that you, you they, they manipulate or utilize the bugs in the existing application for the zero day is through backdoor. So every company needs to document their software vulnerability through CVEs. It's a database that companies maintain to identify what kind of vulnerability they have on the software and how they will be able to address it. And so when you're looking at Linux releases, it will tell you like, oh, they fixed this and this and this, and sometimes that relates to vulnerability. Microsoft has a huge database related to all the applications that they create. Okay. And so you would see that, you know, common vulnerability entries that the call is CVEs. Okay, so for baseline, how can you as the administrator secure the baseline in the network? We are, we can use tools to deploy the system in secure state. So before you deploy, you gotta make sure that you test it, okay? You test the configuration of it. That's including like, for example, if, if I'm using something that ties to my network, I wanna make sure that my security is settings with the appliances, right? If you allow certain services to be connecting, we gotta make sure that like firewall and all of that is in place. We want to measure the integrity of the baseline de deviation using the automated tools. It's automated so that way we don't have to check it all the time, but we also need to monitor those tools. We would use group policy and I will have a couple of labs maybe to do this and we would use the vulnerability scanner. So the difference between your overall security scanner and the vulnerability scanner is vulnerability addresses the weakness, right? Like weak passwords that exist on the system, right? Your certain things were turned off or default configuration has not changed. It's gonna look for that. So vulnerability scanners, when you scan for vulnerability, that's different than scanning for threat. So by definition, a threat is a, something that can negatively impact your, your, your object or your system. But vulnerability by definition is, it is a weakness, right? In the either the, your software or your hardware or even people. So we would need to remediate with NAC. Well, that's what we talked about before, network access control. So last week we touched a lot on that, right? How we look at access from a network standpoint to use your NID and your, your intrusion prevention system, your firewall, your intrusion detection system. So we want to be able to isolate those systems that have that been impacted or been infected quickly. Okay. So when you have a malware on your system at home, the fastest thing that you need to do, right? Unplug the cable or disable the wireless network on. Okay. Because it will come and it will spread. The, the challenge is that people don't know that that malware actually entered their system because about 60% of the malware is known in the wild. That's documented. I'll give you a threat report when we talk about malware in the next couple of weeks, so you can see, okay? And it's always changing. It's one of those games that like, we are always playing catch up, okay? Any question on this? A layered security approach is the best, okay? You gotta look at all areas. All right, so when you are creating, before your deployment, what you're gonna do is you're gonna create what's called a master image. So what that is, is you take an original state of the system. Let's say that you have to do a thousand of these alien layers, right? You know, Alan that came in here earlier, he created the image that you can see, okay? So you would take that and you would put in all the applications that you need, right? Microsoft Office, you know, whatever you need for your company. You also need to configure your system based based on what's required. 
I will have anti-software, anti-malware company, uh, uh, anti-malware uh, software install. I would have the configuration for my firewall. I would make sure that, you know, it might uh, run a, a backup at the end of the day automatically, things like that. So you create what's called a master image. It is a snapshot of your single system. And we want to duplicate that, right? As long as they have the same hardware and as long as they are used for the same purpose. So long ago, when I first became the field technician, that's what I do. I image system, but back then, you put things on CD and you run it individually. And then later on, they start implementing network where you can distribute it from a server as long as you have the bandwidth to connect, okay? So you need to configure the master image to have the security settings before you deploy it. You need to test it, okay? And then, and it changes that master image over time. Now this saves, number one, money. Second, it saves effort. Because instead of reinstalling the same thing a hundred and thousand times, you have that one system that's perfect, right? The image of it and you would duplicate it or replicate it across the network, okay, which is convenient. So that way everybody has the same application setting and it is manageable, okay? Compared to, you know, if you're installing, because even if you hire five technicians, they're gonna do things a little differently. All right, so, you want to make sure that consistency, that's the key word in security is when we deal with images, make sure that it's consistent. Because that way, if you need to fix something, you can deploy the fixes across, you can patch the same thing all across the network and it is centralized and manageable. Okay, so how do you secure a network with many different types of system such as OS, right? Like I might be running different version of Windows OS because some of my computers are old. It's not able to handle the new operating system. And you see this a lot in school districts and our government at the DMV, right? So you need to do what's called patch management. So what we need to do is you need to track the updates like what I talked about, the version of your software and when you updated it. But before you deploy it, you have to set up, you have to set up testing and virtual machines are great for that. Okay. You can also create templates because we want to try for consistency. So if you have like 10 Windows 7 system compared to 110 Windows 10, right, we can template those. And templates can go into policies, which are rules for your system. We can also establish baseline and that baseline entail configuration that will be consistent. So a lot of these are high terminology, but then when it comes down to it, you have to know how to do it, right? So when, when I say template, policy template, where do you go to do that? So we'll do some labs that will have that. All right, so let's talk about how you can automate your system. Scripting is your best friend, okay? So you can create Python script. That's why a lot of students are learning Python these days, right? In security, that's, that's highly essential. Shell script, which is, at Cal State San Bernardino, they emphasize a lot more and then the shell script, which is fine. A lot of companies are using that too. But if you understand scripting or programming, it helps. Um, so we can automate. So I'm going to give you an example, right? Like my CIS 30B class is the Python for networking or the CIS 30C class. We can write a five line script to, to, you know, go out and scan all of the routers and all the network appliances and make a list for us. So you can check to see if they're connecting. You can also send them all to paint, right? So if I wanted to make sure that all my systems are connected, I can launch a script and it will send the packets to the system and then wait for the response. So instead of running around and putting stuff into terminal, you can do that. And you can do it directly into Linux terminal. 
you can also use encryption, right? Um, in automated system, you, you need to also control permissions. So permissions are different than your user rights or privileges because permissions tied to files and folders. Okay. All right. Any questions? So the purpose of establishing your baseline in organization is to really give you the measurements so you can quantify, right, your system performance. And in the case where if there are changes, you can detect the change and manage the change. So can a change be a good change? Sure, right? But a lot of the times when we look at get change that ties to negative risk, that's usually a bad thing, okay? So, but change can be that growth in your company, right? User usage escalating, it might be higher, or change can be things like attacks and so on. Breach, that's a big change, okay? Leaks is, is a big area. Okay, so what's the difference between patch management and change management? We need to know this for Security Club and CISSP if you do pursue that down the line. So patch management ensures that the system and the applications are updated. That's simple, right? So all those Windows updates that, that, that it, you know, every time that you reboot your computer, right, you run your Windows PC, then there's auto updates and you can set it when you want to update. So we normally test updates before we want updates, okay? Because sometimes updates can negatively impact our system, but change management really defines the process of any system modification or upgrade. It could be a malware, that's a modification. It could be somebody reconfigure something on the application or services, that's a, that's a modification, okay? Data growth, right? Like one department would have huge amount of data tremendously over the month, that's a change. So really to have effective patch management, you have to implement change management rules or policy because patch change the system, right? When you update, it changes the state of your system so you have to make sure that you implement how you're going to be able to patch it, how that's going to change your application and your OS and your services. Okay. So this is why all the IT director and the CIO, they make a big bucks, right? Because they actually handle the, either this area or the managers are overlooking the area. And normally those are worked as projects or if they are regularly um, applied, then there will be a dedicated team for that in an enterprise. But in a small place, just a couple IT people, right? Okay, so in the step in patch management, first, you need to identify the patches, right? So in your system, when you say Windows 10, they're actually released version, right? If you look at your system information, where can I find that, Dr. Wynn, you should say, right? Um, if you open up your Windows system information before you type, right? See how my OS, there are release build number that's because it, all it is is Windows 10, but they could be different, right? Um, so you need to find the appropriate patches for that that OS, out of the box, you already need to update, right? Because you hear about zero day all the time. Most of the time we have to update as soon as we have this going. Download the patches from the vendor, that's really easy. Once you download, you can test it. So I can use my virtual machine to do this, right? Make sure I have the same build. After that, we can deploy it to the endpoint. So use a, a server, a network server, to be able to send that all the updates out to the rest, okay? To all your, so Android might need different updates compared to, you know, Apple systems compared to Windows systems. So when you have a mix of things, 
you have to run a lot of different updates. It took a time. Okay, so bring your own device to work can be very hairy. IoT devices at work is difficult. But it gives you a job. So, all right, we need to verify before we install. And so how can you test these things? So you can use sandboxing and in security, there are different form of sandboxing. So you can sandbox for testing security risk assessment, right? Um, like using a gray box, a white box, a black box, and so on. But sandboxing overall is just simply an isolated system to test. So you know what's the, the most secure system in the network? What's the most secure system in the network? An unplugged system. Very smart. I think you probably so an isolated system, a standalone system is the most secure system in the network. A system that's not connected to another system. Right? So when you sandbox, you always want to isolate it because if it has negative results or something happens to it, it can impact other systems. If you need to simulate a network, you can group those together but not connected to your main network. Question. So when you we, we use for in, in system development, if you are doing secure staging and system development, and this is a big area right now because I think that going back to how we design the application, we really need to think about how it it is used, how it can be secure. So version control is very important. I think that when you take my programming class, I harp about GitHub, right? You need to use Git to manage your version, okay? And as developer uses or uh, update the version, they control that. And with that, we need to implement it into change management because it's, you know, now the application changed, okay? And you will have in-house things like inventory tracking type of application, customer service application, all kinds of things, right? We need to also test, and that would include hardware and software. So if you upgrade hardware, you need a test before you change everything, okay? So let's say that they say, okay, tomorrow we're gonna replace all of the monitors in this room, right? We gotta test it with one system and make sure that it works, right? The drivers work, everything works before we start buying a thousand monitors. So we want to, before it goes, so when you, when you hear the term production, that really is when it is used in operation every day. So that will include your systems and support and maintenance and everything else in, in the chain. Okay, so, and when you go into production, you have to maintain the system. You need to support the system and its user. So I just went over some API stuff with my programming class, but you probably hear this all the time, right? Uh, you hear the term API. So API stands for Application Programming Interface. It is a way for an app to connect with another app for services. For example, if you're using a web application and it asks you, oh, you can authenticate by using your Google account or your Facebook account or your Instagram account. So that app is using an authentication API. It is an application that can work with another application for authentication, right? And all they use is OAuth, which is an open source um, for API, okay? So in some case, we might need to implement API for authentic strong authentication, right? You should use, because Implementing authentication doesn't always mean strong authentication. Right? You can make it basic where it stores your password in plain text. You can make it digest where it would store it in um, cache. Or you can make it barrier where it would be access token where it needs to have encryption key. What languages are Instagram and Facebook? They use 
make many different languages, but Golang, uh, JavaScript, mostly. Yeah. Well, um, from the from from the front end, you see that, but in the back, PHP, uh, you name it. So, if I wanted to um, share this on Instagram, like in my current account, I have a unfollow, unfollow, like, like, this, but JavaScript. JavaScript, JavaScript. JavaScript. But be careful when you inject script into those things, because when you inject script, they can see it. You know, application firewall will see it. Yeah. So you, so you can use, you can use like a, a, a framework with API, and then because all of those things are already pre-made for you. So you can you can customize it and then use it. So that's a great thing about it is to be able to use. Um, now, API is used for a lot of different things outside of authentication, of course, right? Um, you can use it for other services. So we can use it to authorize people. We can use it to authenticate people. We can use it to track people. Um, so it's just an application that works with another application. And there are frameworks that you can use with those APIs. Okay, I know this is a lot. You don't have to put down everything. So understand, yes. Consider that somebody can intercept it. Okay. External storage. Um, I normally, when 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 I consult a, a healthcare business or any kind of business that deals with privacy, I reduce all the USB and removable media usage. Period. That like takes away a lot of the, the issues that they're having. Data walking out of the company. People accidentally leaking data, right? Just disable your USB ports in the front and the back of through BIOS, and your book talks about that, or UEFI. So if your image has that set up where we disable the configuration, because they can bring in their USB, they can plug it in all day. It doesn't work, right? And then teach people not to plug into you USB in there. Also, like, you know, they clear desk policy is a lot of companies. Uh, requirement to to make sure that people don't print out stuff they can't leave. You've probably seen the movies of, of Snowden.
COVID, right? He, he has to seek out the USB through his movie cube. So a lot of companies, especially government places, don't let you bring stuff in and out. You can't print, you can't bring USB, you can't bring SD, and so on, right? You got to check your phone in when you come in, and so on. Or you can only use their devices. And it's self-encrypts, okay? So those self-encryption, uh, this can also be useful in protecting your data. Okay, if you're using Wi-Fi micro, uh, enable micro SD, those are also can be intercepted. So we can encrypt those, okay? Encryption takes resources and time, okay? So when we say encryption, it sounds really easy, but if it's even when we decrypt it to read the data, it does, require performance and time, okay? If you're using printers, which, which most companies do, right? Um, like the multi-factor or the multi-functional printer, like scanner, copy, everything in one, those uses embedded system and embedded system run Linux mostly, or it would have internal RAM, right? You probably heard people attacking printers before on the network, video camera, Everything has storage nowadays. Your big copier has hard drive, RAM, processor, all of that. It's a computer. So, you know, with that, it would impose risk. So you've got to protect those too. You got to protect your 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 system that control, you know, air conditioning, like the SCADA system, and everything else that's connected to the network. So there's not an area that you don't touch. So how do we really fix these problems? We need to make sure that they're patched firmware, especially for the IoT devices. We need to configure that they are securely connected to the network. We need to monitor them. We need to make sure that data doesn't leak. And that can be from filtering email, blocking email content that has major keywords like driver license, social security number, and so on. We can use encryption and we can make sure that we protect our network connection. So many different areas. And this is why this field is endless. Because even if you have a good solution, there are other areas that you can improve. So um, I want you to look at an SED so you have an idea of what they are. I found one. And they range from like a hundred something dollars or more. So this is, and you can simply search, right? So if I'm on Google, let me open up another tab. I can search for SED, right? Or self encrypting drive. And then you can look at the shopping. You can find some. So if they are, and, and they can range depending on the technology, the size, and so on, okay? So why is this so expensive, the nitro? Look at the size for that, how much that is, right? 15 terabyte, I will never need 15 terabyte, <laughs> right? But if you are running servers or something like that, you might need that. So that's gonna run you about close to $6,000. Or if you are doing one terabyte with Dell, you can see that it is 300 and about $367. And it's also vary with vendor too, right? So this is a solid state. And when you have the self-encrypting, you know, you don't have to, the user can set it up the first time and then it just automatically does it. And so the nice thing about it, when it's on a laptop, if it's government official, if they lose that laptop, right, we're not, we're gonna be a little bit less worry about the data on that, even if they take that and they try to reverse engineer, it's gonna take them a long time. So a lot of these things are hardware oriented. It uses the TPM chip, which allows you to do drive encryption. And this chip is now built into the motherboard for all your new motherboard. Okay. So Professor, this, yeah. Can you decrypt encryption? Yes. As long as you have the key. Depending on if you're using the key pair, that might be difficult, right? So it's better to get the key and decrypt versus 
right? Trying to reverse engineer and piece everything together takes a lot, a lot longer. Okay. Like how can I enter your house as long as I have the key to your house instead of trying to break the down the door and get the lock <laughs> so on, right? That makes sense? Okay. So it's better to capture the key or impersonate that person to get the key, right? So what better way is to steal the system because the key's on that system, right? I have a question. Yeah. Could, could like the company that make these self the encryption guys, could they have their own backdoor into the program? I, uh, so propaganda, right? <laughs> that might be, right? Um, I don't want to say anything about moment. anybody, but, <laughs> but there's always a, a flaw in firmware sometimes, right? But Selling product comes with reputation, so you don't want to, you know, for example, BitLocker. BitLocker, you can print out the key. Yeah. You can go around and give it to people. <laughs> Here's my encryption key to my external hard drive, by the way. It's in a long way. Have you ever tried BitLocker? Okay, try it, like use a USB, encrypt the whole drive, and then it's gonna give you two options, right? Save the key to that computer under the folder keys, or print it out, right? So you can print it out and say, here's my key. In case I lose it, you can have it. You can open it for me. But the administrator by default, the account has the key in everything. So the attacker would go to the root or the administrator because that can take over anybody, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Share it out to the social network. Here's my key to my drive. <laughs> yeah. Well, so that's today I'm doing an onion router lecture. If you guys ever heard of onion router? So the onion router is a way that we can get to connect to the dark web. It, you can make a Raspberry Pi into Onion Router. You can install Onion Router on your Linux machines. Um, it is, it encrypts every step that it goes. So it would encrypt the first time and then the next hop, it encrypts again and encrypts again until it gets to the end. The only person that sees your URL is the last note, okay? Nobody can see you. It's better than VPN. So some VPN technology actually uses it. So. Um, yeah, okay. It's slow though, yeah. but when you need to get to the dark web, you don't want the people to see who you are, then you can uh, you can use Onion Router. Anyway, so when you're using hardware, right? Like we said last week, everything has interference, right? Your wireless, your microwave, your cordless phone at home, your your speaker, everything has some kind of um interference. So your EMI can cause interruption. You guys ever have your smartphone on and then when you stand in front of like a microphone to talk to people and you hear like, right, the pitchy sound, right, that is a signal, signal cross. And so in that case, it interrupts that signal for the microphone because you have your smartphone on. So you have signal interference and then in some cases that can also cause storage damage. So EMI, right? What, what does that stand for? Electromagnetic interference. So how can you protect that? Shield the signal, right? So if you go into a data center, you're going to see racks, right? And on the racks, they have a lot of cables. And when you have a lot of cables together, you do have signal that bleeds across the cable. So expect that, you know, all of our electronics devices have some kind of signal bleed. Some are better at shielding than other. So on a cable, this is why they put the foil, right? The foil inside your ethernet cable, which makes it an STP, um, actually protect the signal a little bit better than your UTP that doesn't have the piece of foil inside. All right, so how should you secure a storage dish? You should encrypt, you can encrypt the whole drive or you can encrypt the content of the drive. 
The whole drive takes longer, of course, depending on the size of your disk. You would use a hardware chip to protect the storage and the book talks about PPM. I know CS25 also addresses it. It is a chip that goes on your motherboard or your device that uses it to do encryption and it does a lot of different things to really protect that system physically. And you want that, right? But there had always been also a flaw with that chip. I don't know if you heard years back, I think a few years back, Intel faced that problem, but they they already addressed the firmware issue. So having security with it doesn't always mean that it's 100% protected. So if you're using that chip, you have to upgrade the firmware. Okay. And you need to enable it in BIOS in order to activate it as well. Well, okay. you heard about the malware that uh, affects uh, uh, directly on the BIOS itself. That even even after even after resetting the hard drive, it was still on there. Oh, if it's on BIOS, it's yeah. online. Yeah. Or eRAM. So, yeah. Sometimes you know, at the low level, it's really hard to get rid of these things. So. But you know, those are those tend to be those tend to be a lot more malicious because you Could know those actually escape the deep freeze that these provide or no? Well, if it's in RAM, well if it's in ROM, it's 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 stored, it can be read from there only, right? But it cannot be rewritten. So it has to find a way to other areas. I've seen stuff that on RAM that's harder to get. Like root, some root kits are on the low level. Okay, so let's talk about DLP. So when you look at security consulting firm, you always see this, this area first because I think everybody worries about data. So how much does the data cost to the organization? It really is how much it would be to rebuild that data. Um, so in the, in the black market, your data is worth less than $3. Um, your social security, that's including social security job license and so on. I read recently on an article, it was only like a dollar and 32 cents, right? Which is very cheap. So somebody can spend a hundred dollars and get a, you know, a good size set of records of people, valid or invalid information. Um, so companies spend a lot of money really trying to protect data. And we talked about, you know, using encryption, using all of these protection measure. So I said, we need to block USB. That's very important. We need to monitor traffic. And that a lot of the traffic should be monitoring from email and database and, and so on. So some of the keywords that people might be sending out in the email, we can block that, right? As soon as it sees that, it would require administrator authorization or it blocks it from being sent. The majority of the data link happens accidentally too. People accidentally send out attachment that they don't intend to, right? Because they're in a hurry or they're not paying attention. Um, so the email system, if you if you put in a setting to block it, it actually stops that from happening. So you have to think about, there, there are three forms of data and your book doesn't really get in depth with this, but so there's data on the moon, right? Which are what? Your email, right? Mm -hmm. Things that are being transferred, uploaded, and downloaded from the web. Okay. Data at rest. Those are the backup data, the ones that are being stored and archived. Okay. So data on the move, data at rest, and what else do you think? Data in use, right? So data that's being accessed every day by the user. So we can do a lot with the data in use in that we can allow and disallow the user from accessing or not accessing a certain type of data on our network, like our network drives and so on. But the hard one is data on the boot. Like things that are being transmitted from our system, our network to another network. And once it leaves our your network, it's really hard to control, right? You guys ever hear about the data leaks? I know T-Mobile told me, oh, by the way, we leaked your data, but we don't know where it went. So here's like one year subscription of McAfee, and there you go, right? Or, and, and so, so once it leaves your network, 
there we can trace it but it takes a long time to really we can also see how much data we lost and, and how much that will cost us not only that you also face fines so with the government right every every company has to go through compliance and so when you leak data it, it becomes a problem i always scare the business manager i said this is how much it costs you if you leak this much data this is how much i need to be able to give you a better solution so they usually look at the dollar and they're like, oh, okay, so we'll go with this. <laughs> so you always need to quantify that to the dollar if they lose it, right? And the risk. So we filter email, we can encrypt the data and the traffic, okay? A lot of the time we can use encryption to make sure that data is in has integrity. There's not somebody that modify your data in between. Um, and then we want to make sure we control it through permissions and database fields are so important. So you don't want to encrypt the whole database that takes a lot of resources and time and you don't want your user to sit there forever to authenticate or to access their account. So there are certain fields on the database. Those are problems on the relational database that we can protect. Password is one of them. Account number is another, social security, anything that relates to PHI, your, uh, your, your personal um, identifiable information, your PII, you need to protect anything that's sensitive, okay? And that changes too with state regulation and federal regulation. All right, so let's talk about cloud. Any questions on data protection? I'll put the video up tonight. Mm -hmm. no. I, I know it what, is. Uh, let the uh, QA on this lets me uh, copy the word on it. You can also convert it using an app. All right. So, your cloud products. When you're using a cloud, you're renting a server, right? Somebody else's server, whether it's Amazon or Microsoft, etc. So, you might have an on premise cloud, which can be expensive. So basically it's a data center in an enterprise um, at maybe the corporate office, or you can use your cloud service provider, right? Your, your AWS, your Azure, those are some of the bigger companies. So Google emphasize more on application type of cloud where infrastructure, so when you hear the word infrastructure, that will be everything, your network, your, your all your servers, and so on can be through AWS and Azure. Okay. So the type of services that you will have is infrastructure as a service. Okay. And then you would have um, software as a service and platform as a service. So when we say platform as a service, that could be your operating systems, your, you know, so there could be many things that we can include. Sometimes we can have multiple things added. So you need to use what's called the cloud access security broker. And most of the cloud company would have this environment. Um, you hear Cloudflare had issues in the past where they're hosting, uh, you know, uh, terrorists and because of privacy, they're able to protect them, uh, communication because that's their client. And so therefore anonymous hack them, right? So, you know, so you would see all of these companies having security tools, but also because it is a network, their tools is only effective on how they use it. Um, so you can't rely 100% on their cloud tool. You're gonna make sure that you implement necessary measures. Questions? Okay. So I will try to see if like we can do a cloud lab that will be effective this time and not waste your time like <laughs> my second attempt in cis 25 um okay so you might have deployment in hybrid for the enterprise where you have a mix of things um you would see that sometimes they would use public cloud private cloud and then you would have a mix of different things now most companies use elasticity that means that they can adjust based on the cost um which is very very good where we can make you know adjustment throughout the year okay so my recommendation along with learning 
learning network security is to learn cloud security. And the majority of people use AWS and Azure. So those are the two areas. So there is a new certificate that's coming out it's called Cloud Administration. It's different than RCC ones. So if you're interested in that, we can we can talk about the classes in those. Almost done. Okay, so when you are um, having, bring your own device to work. So when you say BYOD, when you look at the job description, it says looking for support technician, right? Um, must be able to configure LAN, WAN, and all of these things. Troubleshoot network devices, et cetera, et cetera. Manage, bring your own device appliances or systems. That means laptop, you know, all your IoT, smart devices, and so on. So how do you handle those? Number one, you need to make sure that they are scanned with malware. And you can set it up where they would be able to scan it um, when they connect to your wireless network, right? We, they won't be able to until they, they have scanned and it's in good status. We need to make sure that their file storage is controlled with policy, okay? That means that on their micro SD, along with how they are accessing storage on the network, because somebody can go through that system and be able to see what files they are accessing and so on, okay? We can also use encryption and you learn about drive encryption um, using different software tools to prevent sensitive data from leaving, even when that phone is locked. Now, mobile technology is really great in that we can lock that system, okay, remotely. We can, you know, once it's locked, it's activated, then they can't access anything. Before, we had to acquire special services for that, and that would be cost monthly. All right, so in Linux, when you're using Linux uh, permission, you would see that it can also use letters or number. We, we touch on this when we look at the letters, right? Like RW for read and write and X for execute. Linux is simplified. I, I love that it doesn't have so many different explicit permission compared to Windows. And you will see that this week when we're working with Windows. So you would see that your read is gonna be four, your write is gonna be two, so if you do a read and a write, that's a two plus four gives you a six, okay? So if you have a seven, what do you think that is? Read and execute, yeah, which is a three, right? A seven is a three plus a four, so it's read and execute. So um, you can quantify the, the permission with the number there, which is great. So if you have a Linux permission that has all zero, what do you think that is? Deny all. Okay. okay, so if you see seven, right? So that just means that it's gonna be read and execute. And then, so you can just combine the numbers to be able to give you a number of permissions. So in the notes, it also describes this briefly, also in your book. And then again, I asked another question, how do you prevent data loss in an organization? Get rid of the removable media, right? Prohibits them from using. So you have to write a set of rules and then configure it. And then we want to do a thing called data exfiltration, which is that we don't want people from the outside to download or store our data. So, unauthorized transfer of data outside of the company. So if we remove the removable media and then we get rid of the, 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 the attachment in the data, uh, sensitive data in the email, and then we can reduce some of the data leak. You can also implement a cloud-based DLP, which filters your data for like personal healthcare information, your private information, uh, and so on. Healthcare is a, a big area right now for a lot of people in security. Um, it is a challenge to so really tackle because we maintain so much data. Like you can't, 
you can't get rid of data because if the patient been there and they've been in, you know, using your service for let's say 20 years, you're going to keep maintaining it forever. So, and then, you know, things are, it has to use different type of encryption and so on. So HIPAA requires, you know, a lot of the, the areas to be highly secure. So. Question. So I can consult quite a few healthcare company and, and it, it is, even though it's like healthcare organization, you're going to see different things that they require and different things that they need. Uh, Throughout different companies. I think I think that's probably going to be our next approach. If I think now that we have the, the, the infrastructure to really handle that, you know, to really use it as a token to really identify who you are. Imagine that, right? Like you have a token and it ties to your device and hit, hopefully we will protect that device like your smartphone and you scan that token and they can load it so they don't have to maintain your data. I think that's, you know, make the user become more accountable for the data. But, but I think most companies want to, manage that data so that way they can really control that user profile right and then sell that data for you know benefits and things like that so we still have to kind of work that out on how that would look and how our privacy rules regulations are at play so i think down the line if you i personally feel that the, if the the user is accountable for the data i think it's it's a little bit better uh, but then you also have severe cases where people can be severely hurt in the case of their data falls into the wrong hand, right? If they, they don't know how to use it or somebody abused their data. So that might change how we look at, you know, digital, uh, all of these regulations and compliance overall. We'll see. Interesting. All right. Any questions regarding chapter five? So I know I'm, you know, an hour and a half. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is it safe to say that it's better to want to stick to like like higher connections like access to like data yes. than like doing like yes. a Wi-Fi? Yes. You can always go. So so uh wire connection gives you more higher throughput. Not only that, it is more secure in that you are not facing like you know issues with with um uh, brute forcing and stuff like that. Um, and sniffing, right? Sniffing wireless is really easy um, or evil twin attack. So you have more attack prone on the wireless side compared to the wired side. And the wired side, we can amp ourselves up with all of these protection systems and be able to detect it a lot quicker. Um, then this is why your backbone is always wired, right? Rarely that I would see, you have to be wired on your backbone, but rarely that you would see 100% wireless anywhere still because I think that, you know, you can achieve like 80% or so, but you still have the essential system that you need to make sure that it's wired and it's faster that way, right? At home, you might be 100% wireless, but you know, your router is still wired, right? So it's like 90, 95% wired. Okay, so if we're done with this, save this and then upload it. Um, I will get your, your lab open tomorrow. Um, so we can do it Wednesday. So we're just going to need to use our desktop and so on. Okay. Any question? I'm sorry. Sometimes I feel like I'm running through this because this concept, like it takes a, it takes to take a little bit to kind of talk, read the chapter, look over the notes, watch the video again, go through the questions. Okay. Have a good afternoon. Enjoy your snacks. I'll be available for questions after class. If you have questions.